Okay, everyone. So welcome to our expert session. Uh, we are delighted to have some fantastic uh, guests with us. Uh, the title is how Premier Golf is using technology to automate on-course operations and increase efficiencies. Um, we'll also talk about play experience and obviously how they uh, get more done with uh, less labor hours. So I'm delighted to welcome Mike Fosnick, who's the Director of Operations of Premier Golf as part of the Dune Group. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Um, we'll get uh, to your introduction right now. And um, I also have Joey Walters, who's the Tag Master GM out of our Atlanta office. Joey, how are you? Good. How about you, Bodo? I'm good. Thank you. Um, and my name is uh, Bodo Sieber. I'm the CEO of Tag Marshall. So let's uh, jump right in it because we want to obviously stay on pace. That's always part of our job. Uh, so what I would like to do first is to give Mike an opportunity to do a quick introduction on himself and the uh, amazing uh, golf courses that he's in charge of and also how you fit into the broader Truin picture. So we're delighted to have you, Mike, and uh, tell us a little bit, bit about uh, what it is that you do and how you do it. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, hello to all my PGA brothers and sisters out there. Um, I'm the regional director of operations for Premier Golf, which is a division of Troon. Uh, we operate uh, for six different cities here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, within those cities, we have 10 golf courses that we oversee. Uh, five of those golf courses are, are busy as five. We uh, use the technology, the Tag Marshall technology to help us um, maximize our our revenue, our rounds, and our customer satisfaction. So uh, I liaison with the general managers at each course and also the city representatives and, and been doing that for about three or four years. I've been in the Northwest PGA section. Uh, I've got my 30 year anniversary uh, this year. So happy to be here. N nicely lined up with the Centennial. Well done. <laughs> uh, Mike, tell us, uh, let's talk some numbers. I mean, you're not just running any old golf courses. You're really busy. And uh, also, what sort of golf course is this in terms of green fees? Because I know everyone wants to know. So tell us a bit about uh, the clubs. We, we run municipal golf courses exclusively. Um, we have, uh, we do 500 to 600,000 rounds a year. Uh, within our 10 golf course portfolio. Uh, so extremely busy golf courses. Um, and with the, uh, the onset of golf's explosion, uh, pandemic levels of golf rose for all of us. Um, for us specifically, we gained 100,000 golfers, uh, 100,000 more rounds uh, and uh, quite a few new golfers that had not been exposed to championship caliber golf courses. Um, so we really found that the necess it was necessary for us to, to take an active role in managing pace of play expectations due to the high volume of rounds that we are seeing every day. And uh, Mike, what's, uh, what's the sort of green fees that, uh, that golfers can expect? And I I'm, think it's wonderful of the Seattle and the municipalities to invest so much in their people, but uh, what sort of green fee level would you say is uh, is it that you that you're featuring? You know, we are we are low to mid. We are um, we offer super senior rates all the way up to you know adult weekend green fees. Our our average rate is somewhere around twenty five twenty six dollars. It's more like forty to forty five dollars on the weekend. That combines uh, senior, super senior, junior rates as well. So an average eighteen hole rate is probably somewhere between you know thirty five and forty five dollars. Mm. Okay, nice. And uh, Joey, I know you have the horrible job to go visit um, so many of our partners <laughs> and uh, you've been to Band and to Kiowa to, uh, to um, uh, Whistling Straits where it was uh, a hell of a freezing. Uh, you've also been up to some of the clubs that Mike looks after. What is your sense and, uh, of, what, of what you found there? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Mike's got, uh, he's got some great golf courses out there, obviously, and very affordable to play and uh, they're in uh, quite a nice setting out there around Seattle. Uh, the views are not too bad either. Uh, so it's, it's a great golf course. It's a, uh, you know, they have great people running the facilities, um, all very friendly and very knowledgeable. It's a very great, it's a, it's a really good experience going out there and seeing these guys and 
seeing how they operate these courses and how they maintain them, uh, you know, and make them affordable and uh, still get a nice golf course to play for an affordable price. Nice. Um, okay. Um, thank you for the introduction, Mike. Really appreciate it. Let's uh, allow me just a quick intro to Tag Marshall for those of you who don't know. We are specialists in on-course uh, optimization and automation. We have tracked, well, it's way more than the 30 million rounds that are on here. And we work with around 500 partners. Uh, we're delighted to work with some of the very best. I believe now it's just about 35 of the top 100. So there's your Oakmont, your Valhalla, uh, Kiowa mentioned, uh, Whistling Straits, Pebble Beach. Um, for us, the exciting thing is that uh, all of these standard facilities are solving the same problem um, effectively as Mike is with a $30 facility. Um, for us, what's brilliant is that we get to learn from these um, operators as much as we get to learn from Mike and then bring that back into our system so that we can help um, others in, in the industry. We also uh, very fortunate to work with a lot of the PGA section, like the Northwest section that I mentioned, and uh, have got a lot of industry partners that we look to um, you know, just help grow the game with and add value where we can. And uh, yeah, that's why I think it's, it's quite special that we get to collect data from all of these amazing clubs. And, and there's a lot that we get to learn from that. And that's why we host these uh, sessions like this one, just to to present a, a platform for some of those uh, really good operators to share some of the insights of, of what they're learning and, and, and how they go about uh, their business. So today's um, topics that we want to chat about is what are some of the key golf labor market challenges that, uh, that you've seen. Mike uh, has got quite a few people to look after. Mike, what did you say? It's about uh, a couple of hundred, right? That's, um... during, during the season, the height of our season, we're close to 500 employees, um, you know, seasonal. And then we drop down to probably 250 in the wintertime. Um, and that represents, you know, 10, 10 facilities, 10 golf courses. So there's lots of, um, lots of labor management that needs to happen. So the, the second portion is how technology solutions automate and optimize on-course operations. And what is the impact on efficiency? Because that's the name of the game. And it has this positively, positively affected flow um, of play and the play experience because the play experience and Mike will tell you that that is the be all and end all certainly for his uh, clubs that and, and their work and then um, the other big question is what about revenue has it had an impact on revenue so so those are some of the uh, topics that we want to shine a light on but let's start with um, some of the sort of broader um, challenges that the industry has been facing Mike mentioned we've had a huge demand uh, period on golf and obviously we you know we need to rely on our people to facilitate and manage it all. Um, what have you seen, uh, Mike, in, in terms of uh, staffing, in terms of labor issues up in, in your area? I think like um, all golf courses throughout uh, the world, um, labor has been a challenge. You know, We've had our unique challenges up here in the Northwest as well. Um, with, with the onset of the pandemic, um, you know, we went from total shutdown to partial reopen to full reopen and a lot of our staffers just would not come back um, due to COVID precaution issues um, and we found that the labor pool was was very much um, in a drought scenario where there just weren't a lot of candidates applicants for the jobs that we had. Um, never more true than our, our Marshall fleet. Marshalls uh, basically disappeared. Um, they did not want to uh, interact with that high volume of people um, and here again, COVID concerns um, kept more people at home and not willing to, uh, to venture forth and be able to fill our, our roster roles of, of marshals like we had in the past. So um, we had started talking about using technology before the pandemic started. Uh, we, we got going July of 21st. So we had a partial season uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. And what we found was the technology helped us um, minimize our labor needs because we were able to use the data uh, and the, the map of the golf course in real life time to be able to react to you know, issues that came up where our clients, our golfers needed some assistance, you know, the, the golf professional themselves or the assistant pro or the, 
the the shop cashier would be able to to go out there directly to where the the issue was and offer assistance and we found also by using data you know not every group is behind and not every group needs assistance so um, instead of having a marshal drive around the golf course all day every day um, we really didn't need that kind of coverage because we had the eye in the sky so to speak uh, we knew what was happening on the golf course in real time without having to drive out there so um, the, the technology was, was a huge boon for us, uh, because the, the labor challenges, um, just did not allow us to marshal the golf course the way we used to. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. We are getting that the same sort of consensus uh, right through the, the many areas that we work in. And, uh, Joe and I were recently at the NGCOA, that's the National Golf Course Owners Association, um, MCO event in, in Charleston and uh, labor issues were one of the you know, top ranked sort of discussion points. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to launch a poll just to see what our audience um, has experienced. Um, so guys who are checking in, um, push your buttons here. The number of candidates for each position that you've tried to fill this season, has it been less or slightly less or much the same or no, no issues at all finding, finding people? Um, just uh, throw it in, and, and and one of the things that uh, that we would naturally find if we have to compete for a smaller pool of labor is that we'd probably have to offer higher wages, right? Um, is that um, is that something that uh, yeah that that you've come across, um, Mike, or or is this uh, where you immediately said, well, let's try use technology so so that we can get more out of our existing labor pool, or, or both? Yeah, you're you're correct. Um, you know, we're all competing for labor, and you know, the quickest way to get a leg up over your competition is to offer a higher wage. Um, I think we're fortunate that most people that work in the golf industry love love the game and they love being a part of the game and a part of the business. So uh, we utilize that. We utilize a, a positive you know, culture um, where they feel like they're part of a family, part of a team. Um, but they have embraced using the technology because it just makes makes their job easier, especially the assistant golf professionals, the directors of golf, the GMs that uh, ultimately are there to ensure a positive experience every day. So um, yeah, our, our challenges have been, we have had to offer uh, higher wages um, to get candidates to even come in for an interview. So um, minimum wage really doesn't mean much anymore up here in the Northwest. Uh, for sure. Um, okay, let me end the poll and just share it. Um, just interesting to, to look at this. So, our audience has said much the same as the NGCOA, which is obviously the, the course owners significantly less than a year ago versus 32% uh, slightly less, relatively the same. And uh, no one has had zero issues with, with staffing. Um, Joey, I know that uh, there were a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of talks around this and uh, labor, labor challenges is also something that reaches as far back as the the MCO event the, the previous year that you attended in, in California. Yeah. Um, with, with any anything that stood out for you that uh, um, that you think is worth sharing? Um, I, I think it was quite interesting to see how golf is uh, becoming more embracing of technology. Mm. Um, you know, we all have to do a little more with with a little less. Uh, you know, don't know how long that's going to last, but, uh, you know, seeing technology come into golf now is uh, hopefully going to help assist with some of those labor issues and, you know, and uh, make courses run more efficiently and things like that. So uh, it's kind of exciting to see the different technologies coming into golf and how uh, a lot of golf courses are starting to really embrace it. Yeah. And, and I think we're, we're all very blessed, obviously, that uh, um, COVID has gifted golf three million additional players in, in the States and lots of lots of volume. It's also a really fast forwarded some of the adjustments that courses would have been a bit slower to make in terms of switching on technology opportunities. Um, that was all part of uh, that 
I suppose, a bit of a step change. Um, and that's a good segue into our uh, next section, how technology solutions automate and optimize on-course operations. So Mike, um, you're obviously running uh, cart fleets at your um, at your setups and they have our tag marshal classic install unit uh, installed. So those units then send data back to the system, which Mike's gonna talk about just now. Um, I know that um, our marketing team insists that I show our eight inch uh, two way as well, which is just that other level of automation because it's got the golf interaction with the, to the pin yardage and, and a whole lot of, of extras. Uh, but uh, the core of our system is really the, the data backend um, and what that allows the, the operators uh, to do. So um, Mike, from, from your point of view, and I know that this is, you know, in your second season now is uh, almost feels superfluous to explain, uh, but you mentioned earlier that you are eye in the sky. And so how do you use this? Uh, what What is it that you can see here um, in this sort of example course? And how does your team use this live view of what's happening out on the course on a, on a day-to-day -day basis? It's, it's really helped us, you know, learn the, uh, the natural flow of each golf course, you know, as, we know we have uh, choke points on all of our golf courses where it takes just a little bit longer to play. Um, the three color code system makes it easy. So if, if a card is out there and it's, it's circled green, everything's fine. You know, we don't need to go drive by those people. We don't need to interact with those people. Um, you know, most of the time they see a marshal coming and they get apprehensive. What did I do? And, and, you know, there have been a lot of negative, um, interactions between marshals and golfers that we've had in the past where we just didn't have the information to accurately assess what was really going on. So if you look at number 13 on the screen there, that's a golfer that's playing slow, but is not necessarily delaying anybody. So we've also learned, you know, to basically leave that golfer alone, um, not create any kind of uh, apprehension on their part that, you know, they're doing something wrong. Um, you know, the, the circle number 17 is the one that we're concerned about because um, that means that group is actually delaying the gr groups behind them. And so when we see that happen, you know, we are able to, to go out there in real time. And, and our goal is just to offer help and assistance. You know, hey, what can we do to help you? We, we educate the golfers on what the color code system means, but you know, we're very um, specific in our interactions out there. So uh, the whole number, number six with the circle, number 17, you know, we closely watch those, those uh, golfers as they're moving through. And we can use the analytics hub to look at what's actually happening to the golf course behind them. So uh, one surprising feature that we found is there's only two to four groups per day that really create a delay. Um, I thought it was quite a bit more on a busy day, uh, but if we can make, you know, at least two of those groups aware of where they are on the course and help them move forward, it just creates a better experience for everybody. Um, and we've run into golfers that just are not cooperative and they're very combative. Um, they do not want to, um, to listen to our, our advice or, or take our, uh, our advice or help um, they just want to be out there and they're more disruptive than anything else. And, and we are able to isolate who those people are. And we just, we don't invite them back because, you know, one, one or two bad groups can spoil a whole day if you let it happen. So we're not afraid to, uh, to use that leverage to at least get them to, to kind of help us out a little bit. So, yeah, we, we are looking at this, this course map um, all day, every day at the counter. Um, yeah, I think you, you make it some great points. Firstly, how accurate your team now is, right? It's not a, a guessing game. What does that gap between the playing groups now mean the one group's quick and the other group slow? Like we're not sure. So because our system really goes and calculates what is uh, the risk of that any group might pose on the rest of the field. So like Mike said, this group 17, um, our system has established they're on hole five, they're six minutes behind, their trend is slow. You can see the first two holes, they were fine, then they started to drop off. So they, they're going to get worse and they have a tail of two groups already. So if you don't intervene, they're going to 
make the next 20 or 30 players a day quite bad, right? And it really comes down to the head of the snake. And if you know that information, then you can go act on it. Um, and uh, yeah, what we also, we integrate with um, yeah, most of the, uh, the good T-sheets out there. So we can then pull in a play names. You can even make, make that a more personal engagement. And sometimes it's good to also check in with the uh, players who are, who are quick and just uh, going around nicely and just tell them that they're doing well, right? So any of these interactions is, is valuable because now you have data uh, to, to back yourself up. Um, so here we've got uh, two of your courses. Um, Mike, just remind me, does, you obviously know them well enough. Which one is this one? I believe that's uh, Legion Memorial. And the one on the right? Uh, that looks like Jefferson Park. Jefferson Park, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, your responsibility is towards 300 players out there, right? And, uh, oh, for sure. I mean, we get, uh, during our, our busy season, you know, almost up to 400 rounds a day mm -hmm. at our busier golf courses. Um, so, you know, the analytics hub is, is really, really great because you can – look at what's happening that day. You can look at back at what happened during the week or the month. And you can also identify where on your golf course you're gonna have slower play. Uh, you share that information with your superintendent. If you have a super busy Saturday and hole number three, four, five are, are traditionally tougher to play, make, make those holes play easier and faster. Put, put the pin in the middle of the green and move the tees up to get people through there um, on your busier days. You can always put that pin, tuck that pin in the back on a Monday or move mm -hmm. the tee box during the week when it's not quite as busy. I mean, the, the superintendents really appreciate the information as well because it really helps them with the overall satisfaction because we know that you know course conditions are also a very important part of customer satisfaction. So, um, you know, we, we, we share this information with them and I think they appreciate being part of the process. Um, yeah, you're making a, a great point. And we're going to, uh, to talk about the player experience just now. And we'll probably find that course conditioning will come up in that part of the conversation. But uh, before we go there, um, one of your key drivers for getting technology was because you wanted to be efficient. Um, and you keep mentioning the analytics hub, which will uh, look at also in just a minute. But uh, one of the key things that we're looking to bring into golf is uh, real data and making sure that um, that our partners have got data to make good decisions with. And that's both live data, like with this live app, but also the underpinning data. Uh, because you can never know enough about your business, right? And your business is to make sure that golfers have an amazing experience. And that's it. So what gets measured gets managed. And if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So that's where I'm delighted that Mike and the team are embracing this opportunity and then also taking it into the other departments to make sure that there's a continuous improvement across. Uh, so from an um, efficiencies point of view, uh, Mike, you mentioned the technology is your eyes. And uh, so maybe just one or two other comments on, on what, what that has meant to you and your staff and your managers in terms of having this information available at their fingertips, both from a live map, but also the, the track map. If, if there's ever a question, how did this round actually go? Um, what's a, the day-to-day -day experience like uh, for, for your teams out there? Well, and, you know, as, as every golf course up here this season has been, you know, crazy busy, we've, we've really focused on three very simple things when it comes to interacting with our our golfers, you know, first one is, is very clear, accurate communication. So when a golfer walks in the pro shop, we have TVs, which has our live map and also gives the golfer the goal time and the expected time that day. So we make sure that we are communicating that before they walk out the door and off to the first tee. So they have a clear understanding of what our goal is and we are truly committed and care about their time but also realistically, what will the time be for their round that day? So, you know, Saturday morning at West Seattle in August, it may be a five hour round. You know, there's, there's 350 golfers out there in front of you. And a lot of them are not Tiger Woods. So 
you know, you've got golf balls that going everywhere and so forth. So telling that golfer, hey, it's going to be five hours, but we're going to do everything we can to get you around in a reasonable amount of time. It kind of builds some trust um, to where there's not the unspeaken un, or unspoken, um, hey, I expect to play in, in four hours, but I played in five. You did something wrong. Um, you know, golfers are, are very, they, they don't understand the, the scenario that they're in sometimes. Uh, first time out of the gate, the golfer probably knows they're going to play in maybe three, three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. You know, the 400th golfer teeing off, you know, that's just not possible. So um, that clear, constant communication is our, is our number one. We, we have data and analytics posted all over our clubhouses. You know, they, they cannot miss our sign. We will give them um, our average time for the month. We will give them, you know, different uh, holes that are faster versus slower, things like that. And then the most important thing is now our staff has the ability to react to the issues that do come up on a daily basis. So um, uh, what we have eliminated is 75% of our complaints. Mm -hmm. So when, you're, when your golfer comes off the golf course and they, they believe that you didn't really truly care about their time, they're not, they're not sending reviews in. Um, so that's the biggest thing is, is we have eliminated three quarters of our, of our complaints. Um, one of our benefits also is now we have our customers coming in complaining about our competitors who don't use the technology. Yeah, well, course A, it took me six hours. Course B, I'm never going back. Um, you lose golfers when they don't have a good experience and then they threaten to never come back. So, um, you know, that's and that's a challenge, obviously, for all of us when you lose a foursome. And they just, for some reason, they don't want to return to your facility anymore. So um, I feel like, we, you know, we've been able to, uh, to keep our rounds up and our revenue up because our golfers are continuing to play at our courses. Yeah, I think uh, some, some excellent points made here, but uh, the, the, the don't underestimate the impact that you have had and, and your team's management on your round times, because I did not find um bad days you know like it just asking our analytics and our and customer success team will uh, give me a bit of insight on how the courses are doing in the premier group and they say well they're all doing great you know there's four hour round posted everywhere and that's on really busy golf courses so um i think we'll we'll, we'll look at some data just now but uh, don't um yeah, don't don't be too modest here with the, the, Im, the effect that that uh, your your team have on the experience for your players. And I think that's maybe a good point to to jump on the um, on the exp to the experience portion. But uh, I have also uh, just seen there's a question here: How are you monitoring the groups who are walking? Um, Joey, maybe I can ask you to answer that question in terms of what Tag Marshall can do for clubs that do walking mm -hmm. golf or both. Sure. Um, we have a Tag Marshall uh, classic tag and we have a walking tag. Uh, so we, we call them carts and, and walkers here. So um, what we do is we put a walking tag. Uh, it's a small little thing about, I compare it to about the size of two Zippo lighters put together. Um, and you can tag that to a person's bag. And as they walk around the course, you can get the same kind of data uh, that you're getting off the classic cart. Um, it all feeds back into the same system. So that's how we track our, our walkers. Um, okay, let me just, uh, as we move into the next section, um, how does this affect flow of play and the play experience? Maybe asking the audience, what do you think are the top player experience factors? Um, and while we are getting in your poll results, um, Mike, if you look at uh, this list here, course design, course conditioning, clubhouse and amenities, pace and flow of play, playing partners, who is in my group, accessibility, tee times, availability, cost slash value. Um, if you're thinking about what's a golfer think, and you come across thousands of them, but also yourself as a golfer, you, you, uh, you'd love to get out there. What are the top three for you as a golfer? The top uh, three well, for sure, course conditioning, um, 
pace and flow of play are the two were the biggest complaints we were gotten years past. Um, and then I would say the last one would be uh, tee time availability because the, the golf courses are, are so busy. You have to get up at midnight almost to book a tee time two, two weeks in advance. Um, so, you know, the, it, you know, fortunately for all of us in the Northwest, you know, golf is, is, has seen a, a significant increase and we've had, you know, fairly dry weather in our season. So um, it's, it's been a great, a great boon. So when, when everybody's full, it really comes down to the experience factor, you know, how were they treated, you know, whether it's a, a friendly face at the, at the clubhouse, um, a, a marshal who is nothing but but nice and kind and encouraging a starter, you know those kind of things. You develop a reputation uh, for your facility and the culture of of, of the place that you play. Um, and then I think you know for us, you know we we topped out at six hundred five thousand rounds last year, which was a an all an all year high, and and we're not quite as busy as that pandemic year, but. Our, our revenue is up. So our rounds are slightly down, but our revenue is up over that pandemic year. So, you know, dynamic pricing, as we all know, works when you're busy. Um, your price goes up when you're busy. So if the value of your product justifies paying a little bit more, you're winning. So, and here again, it's just efficiency. You are saving money by using late technology versus added labor. Yeah, I think uh, we'll we'll talk about the the revenue side um, a bit more in just a minute. Uh, just a quick look at what our uh, guests have polled here: pace and flow of play coming out tops, course conditioning coming out high, and then cost and value. And interestingly enough, I would argue that if your course conditioning is great and your flow of play is great, that's value. <laughs> so. Um, Everything else is a bonus from here on, but those are the basics. And if you do those really well, you'll always have customers, um, and they always come back. Uh, they always come back for more. So yeah, thank you uh, everyone for uh, pushing your buttons here for us as well. Uh, what's really low is um, clubhouse and amenities, even though that often gets a lot of big budget attention. Um, and what's uh, low as well as course design because let's face it it is what it is even though we obviously work with enough clubs also they have multi-year data that they then eventually use the data learnings to make adjustments or renovations to their course to make things uh, better or flow a little bit better um, and that's that's good to have information data around as well yeah but uh, you notice 92 percent um pick pace of play and, and flow of the golf course uh chris strauss with troon uh, introduced us to uh, True and Premier Cares About Your Time. And it was a marketing effort that we um, we give golfers suggestions, helpful hints as far as how to play faster. But then we actually post our goal time and we make sure the customer knows that we do have a goal for each and every round. And our goal is to meet and or exceed, you know, those expectations. So, you know, that that marketing effort and push, we've, we've gotten that message um, pushed out to every one of our golf courses that utilize it. And um, it's, it's been extremely effective because now the, the awareness that we care about this issue has, has created a lot more help, a lot more happy golfers than anything. So I, I thank Chris Strauss for that. Yeah, um, 100%. And he certainly lives and breathes uh, those true values, right? And uh, what a fantastic opportunity to really shape um, golf for millions of, of, of players. Um, so here's some of the analytics hub data that uh, Mike was referring to. Um, and this is a clean bill of health for, um, for one of your courses here coming in at four hours, two minutes with uh, yeah, what looks like almost uh, 4,000 players tracked in, in this, in this month is busy. And, um, you can see the interaction here gets logged on each day. So if, if there's interaction, also we, we're logging intervention success. So you guys go out, have an interaction, are they successful? And down here is the distribution of the pace. And you can see how everyone's literally flying through the course because you are uh, managing uh, things so well. Uh, one of the things, Mike, that you mentioned is 
uh, the the whole by whole data and how you then uh, look and evaluate and feed that back to your super um, intendant uh, teams is is this something that uh, you found took a bit of time for them to um, to be interested in or were they quite on it the moment that you made it available you know I, I think they appreciated the information because it wasn't us just coming to them with what would be considered our opinion um, you know this is actual data that's happening on on the golf course that we both share the operation um, you know John Harbottle famous golf course architect and friend of mine once met, told me hey every golf hole is not meant to be easy so most golf courses have two or three holes that that are just flat difficult to play um, and I think being able to understand that also allows us to manage the play of that specific hole. So at Jefferson Park, for example, you know, the first three holes are, are challenging. They, they tend to um, kind of get a little bit slow out of the gate. Um, knowing that, we're able to set up the golf course to make sure the flow is a little bit easier through those three holes. And then maybe some of the easier holes we toughen up or we tuck a pin or or so forth. So, um, you know, not knowing what your product is and how your golfers are playing it every day, you're really doing a disservice for, you know, how you're presenting that golf course each day to those golfers. So um, we, we use the analytics hub, can, you know, extensively and the, the June numbers that we're looking at there, we post those numbers, you know, we, we let the customers know what those numbers are, especially the rounds on pace you know, when we're close to 90% for all of our golf courses, rounds on pace, you know, you need to tell the customer that, I think. You need to let them know. And and more than just word of mouth, po post those things everywhere. So, I mean, that, that fights our complaint battle more than anything because they know that the Seattle golf courses, Everett golf courses care, and they've invested energy and, and rev, you know, resources to, to help us provide a better product for, for those golfers in those cities. So, um, it's exciting for us to share that information with our clients because I think it just validates what we felt all along was an important part of managing golf courses. And, and technology is, people love technology and, it, and it's um, creeping into golf every day and for, in, in, a, in a good way. Um, yeah, and, and I do think that you're also quite uh, progressive when it comes to your range setup, aren't you? Yeah, we, we've, uh, we've implemented top tracer at our Seattle ranges and it's been uh, very widely accepted and received. Um, the amount of range revenue exclusive of range ball sales uh, is gonna cl come close to half a million dollars this year in our three Seattle mm -hmm. ranges. So that's, that's the interaction with being able to play golf on the range, uh, enhance practice ability, more, more data that the golfer is getting. Um, and, and we keep the price reasonable. It's a it's a four to six dollar add-on to the bucket, really, when you look at it. So, um, and the revenue continues to grow, which to me means the the ability for the golfer to continue to use the technology is something they they welcome. No, that's great to hear. Um, but again, well done to the team of four hundred seven, four hundred two. Um, like, if I'm a golfer and I know that's the course I can play at, um, that's the one I want to go to, right? So that's yeah, and, uh, and West great. Seattle is is definitely our our most championship of the golf courses it's oh, the most difficult yeah. it's the longest um so we we anticipate west seattle to play uh a bit longer than the other two golf courses you know our goal time for west seattle is four hours and 30 minutes so we're very very pleased to see that we're coming under those goal times pretty consistently yeah um look uh, you can have a fantastic round of golf that's five hours long um, for instance, Aaron Hill's goal time is five hours, two minutes, and it's the best round of golf you can play because it's incredibly long, incredibly tough, and it's a walking course. So time is one thing, but obviously the, the product that you are selling and that you are offering, um, it's, it's about volume. It's about uh, the, the community that you're trying to attract. And I, I believe that you also have quite a diverse um, a customer, uh, customer field, which is brilliant to hear. But uh, yeah, the, it's great to to have the uh, the acknowledgement that the, you, the work that your team puts in and and the the processes that you're putting in 
are having such a big impact on on the experience. Maybe yeah, I, one I, have, is... I have I have two really good stories. Um, I was playing uh, out at Jackson Park, and the first five six holes were just taking forever. Um, and one of the marshals comes out and he tells me, "You're going to play in four hours and ten minutes." And I would have given him a hundred dollars to say no way. Um, <laughs> But he knew the flow of the golf course and the back nine would play faster. And, and sure enough, I played in four hours and 10 minutes. And, you know, the guy looked like a genius to me because he was able to give me accurate information, which I didn't believe. And then the other story is, is all of us get out on the golf course and we get behind a slow group and we're waiting. And the first thing we think is, where's the marshal? So I'm, I'm no different. I'm on the fourth hole at Jefferson Park. And it's like, where's the marshal? All of a sudden, the marshal shows up. And he goes and he helps the group in front. They, it was almost like I summoned the marshal myself, but there's nothing more satisfying when, when the golfers start to, to get a little bit antsy out there to, to, for us to show them that we're reacting and we're helping solve the solution. So, you know, yeah, per, I've, I've benefited from personally and, and it's exciting to see that our staffs, you know, understand the technology, but more importantly, know how to implement it properly without creating adversarial interactions with golfers yeah i think um i think you're making a great uh, point and that really also ties in with um this phrase that you coined that you're in the golfer enjoyment business um and i think that really uh, sums it up so well so you want to make sure that you you hit the the spot with those big experience factors and it seems like um, the effort your team is putting in and, and the focus you have on it um, is, paying, is paying dividends. And paying dividends uh, leads us into the revenue question. Um, I didn't plan this, honestly. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, yeah, a few uh, key phrases. You have dynamic pricing. Um, and let me just jump back quickly to this analytics hub. So, so this curve that you're seeing here is how the day runs at, um, I think this is Jackson Park or Jefferson Park. So, so you see that uh, the start of day is quicker then things um, start to uh, slow down a bit. End of day is quicker. Like this is quite a, a standard curve. We often see a big spike in time in the mid morning and sometimes the afternoon speeding up rapidly. Every golf course got a different profile. Uh, but what our team helps um, with uh, with our, our customer success is how can you get more out of your tea time understanding this? Um, and one of the um, the opportunities is if you've got good control over this, uh, like you and the team now have, is where can you tighten intervals, especially when things are quick? And where can you start selling specifically quick rounds to people who like to pay a little bit more for that, tie that in with dynamic pricing, create another tea time that you never had, especially in that key dynamic pricing range. Um, and how can you add maybe another tea time later in the day that you never had because you don't want people to play into the twilight. So that is where optimizing this really has uh, some, some bottom line benefits. And, and, and these staggered goal times that those strategies are in play at Kiowa and Pebble at many, many, many other courses. And we often see our partners engage with that in year two or three, once they've got a good handle and good control over things on their course that they've never had before. So, but let's jump back to the, um, the revenue side of things, because ultimately you, you said that you're in the golf enjoyment business experience, the experience business, but, uh, uh, the business end goal is, is revenue and then profitability. So maybe a, a couple of thoughts on on the, yeah, how, how really focusing on this is, is helping your cause. Well, most, most private clubs that I know, they, they run 10-minute uh, intervals. Um, not really difficult to, to keep a pace of play go going when, when you're, you're heading out every, every 10 minutes because that really gives the golfers plenty of time to complete the whole and not create uh, too much um, lag. You know, we run seven and a half minutes. So if, if you quickly do the math, it doesn't work. So a golfer cannot get out there, hit their drive, hit their second shot, move on to their third shot in seven and a half minutes. So in the past, before pandemic golf levels increased, you know, we'd have no shows, which obviously is an unsold tee time. Um, and you know, that, that would always get us back on pace but that would basically, we'd lose the revenue. So a lot of our marketing efforts were always to, to fill the slower times, to, to drive off peak revenue and those kind of things. Cause you know, we weren't at capacity. So 
you can imagine when the rounds increase and you're at capacity and you're running seven and a half minute tea times, you know, now there's, there's no elbow room and there's no people that are actually not showing up. So we realized very quickly that we don't necessarily want to extend the interval between groups because that doesn't solve your pace of play problem. And a lot of people think that if you just go to 10, 11, 12 minute intervals, your pace of play problem goes away. It's, it's further from the truth because a slow group is a slow group, no matter what time the group teed off behind them. So the train still stops. So we had to focus on taking an increased capacity of, of golfers and rounds and get them around in a way that they were satisfied. So by being successful in our, in our round times, we were actually able to increase our revenue because we didn't have the golfer walk away saying we're never coming back. The golf round took six hours and literally our business is going elsewhere. So when you have a, a group a week that says we're never coming back and you start to add those, those groups up and the amount of money they spend per week, that, that hurts, that hurts you. So I think we've, we've gained revenue due to the fact that we haven't lost golfers. And more importantly, I think we're getting golfers from our competitors that are walking away saying we're never coming back because you can't get us around. I mean, all the golf courses are busy in the Northwest. So the one that gets everybody around in the proper amount of time is definitely going to be one that's sought after versus one where the expectations are just continually not met. So, um, we're also able to, to charge more money uh, through dynamic pricing. You know, dynamic pricing only works when you're busy. Um, so the, the higher green fee rate has, has been acceptable because the, the experience was one that people enjoy. So, um, you know, revenue, I, revenue is a planned event. I've been, I've been living with that for 30 years and profit drives everything. So you, the golfer experience is important, but not at the expense of financial performance. So if your client is interested in using technology, the first thing you have to tell them is it will make you money. It's not just a, hit, a sunken cost. It will absolutely make you money. Um, and we're a perfect example of that. We have the data to show that, you know, hey, rounds are down a little bit to pandemic record year, but revenue's up revenues up so um you know that's that's the biggest thing a lot of, of cities or, or course clients or private owners you know they're maybe a little hesitant to invest in technology because they look at the sunken cost and they don't look at the uh, the bottom line you know how it will help their revenue so uh you know for us uh we've had record revenue months and uh, it's kind of you know the best of all worlds i think yeah, I think we, we're seeing this um, all over in that if you if you couple the two, um, you get your your pace right, you look to optimize, find um, incremental opportunities within really understanding um, your course um, to provide the best possible experience. And then you tie in dynamic pricing. That's the winner. We've got a partner up in Michigan that they've uh, done 20 percent increase in green fees doing that strategy they're doing a lot of what they call fast lane rounds which is just the first couple of tea times in the morning they're committing people who want to play quickly and then they charge them a bit of a premium for that privilege and there's yeah, we, uh, we, do, they, we do the fast play rounds at our west seattle course hmm, no fantastic and that is um there are players who, who they're literally saying i can play more golf if i know that i can get through here in 340 or 3 330 uh, please give me that and I'll come back more often, right? Yes. Um, and there's data that shows that, um, especially also younger players who are the guys that you're trying to attract and retain, they're time stretched. They've got families, you know, that for them, like uh, have a seven, eight hour session out is a, um, a huge commitment. So if you can give them certainty around that, and you're saying it, you're posting it all over your clubhouses, right? Okay, you, that's what you get with our product. Um, that, that makes their decision to to come and play with you so much easier. Um, yeah, so that's uh, uh, yeah that that's uh, that that's great uh, great points made here. Let me just quickly check in if there's any Q and A questions um, that have come through. Um, okay, we're, we're bang on time. Um, I just wanted to add one more 
uh, point we do have a lot of private clubs as well and they're literally saying like we want an insurance and a system that will help us ensure every single round here is excellent even if our intervals 12 minutes because exactly what you said earlier while we give people more breathing space and they have an exclusive uh, course to themselves if the train stops the train stops you know and you cannot get that time back that's a, the team from oakmont are saying well what works for the uh, for the daily fee courses who are trying to create more tea times and more certainty is the same thing that works for us because everyone wants to play here. All our members want to bring their friends. So if we can accommodate more people and provide the best possible experience, we are winning. It's worth so much to us. Um, I think we are at uh, the end of our conversation. So I'd, I'd love to invite uh, any questions um, that the audience might have and maybe also a quick intro to Michael Glanville, who looks after our partners um, in the Northwest. Um, I believe he's due in town um, in the next couple of weeks as well, which is great. Okay, here's a question. Um, okay, is this, Natalie, help me, a, a form, is, oh, PDR points. Okay, you can all see that. If you want your PDR points, which I believe used to be called MSR points, um, there's a few questions here for you to check in see if you paid attention to Mike <laughs> um, and uh, then you can have your points and I hope you've all learned something um, I, I'm not seeing any questions here right now Mike what is it that you would want um, yeah, somebody to know who's thinking right now maybe should we consider technology for next season or should we wait another year like what would you say well, and, and up here in the Northwest, you know, I'm available to to have a conversation with anybody that has more questions regarding the Tag Marshall product. Um, they can come out and see how we use it. Uh, we can talk about best practices and what what we've learned. Um, you know, there's there's geofencing in the winter time where you can keep uh, golf cars off the turf um, to maintain healthy turf through the winter. There, there's so many things in the software that we haven't even dabbled into just because we've been so busy the golf courses i mean the, the the product has helped us immensely but we're excited to continue to learn more about what it can do for us but anybody in the northwest that has specific questions or just would like you know some real practices uh you know please reach out to me i'm pretty easy to find <laughs> uh, can't miss mike he's a pretty big fella <laughs> <laughs> tall guy <laughs> yeah so oh, i yeah. have a mic i have a mic story for you bodo and oh, maybe a question for mike while we're at it so when i was out there uh last season and uh we were installing the system at that point uh mike had made up uh made up his mind that he really wanted to um, attack the choke points on the course and he had some ideas around sending um a beverage cart out, you know, to some of those points. So I wanted to ask Mike, were you able to ever do that? And, you know, did you have some success while you guys were working through um, your initial pace of play and getting it, you know, under control at that time? And, uh, you know, did it buy you the time to kind of help, help soften that situation? Oh, absolutely. You know, and what we found is with, with beverage cart, being able to track the beverage cart as well, is you know we know when the beverage cart's taking an unauthorized break out there you know and mm -hmm. there's it's 80 90 degrees and there's thirsty golfers and the beverage cart's parked under a shady tree for 20 minutes so we we know that because we put a tracker on the beverage cart so um also being able to uh to look at the flow of that beverage cart where it is going and, and be able to kind of fine tune you know the the path that the beverage cart should be taking and um, oh, it's it's been tremendously helpful because the if I'm a beverage card employee, I want to go where I'm going to sell things, you know. So yep. they they know the the fourth hole at Legion Memorial that tea box. They're far enough into the round that they're most likely going to buy a beer or two. So um, yep. you know they they're gonna they're gonna jump on that area just like a, a shark in the water. So um, it's been very very much. Um, profitable when it comes to food and beverage revenue as well. It's great. It's great. Thank you. I just wanted to ask that question because uh, that kind of told me Mike's mindset 
when we were initially installing. You know, he's already thinking about all these things he wants to do out there to make it a better experience. And, uh, you know, I'll just tell you that if, if you're ever out that way and you're in Seattle, I can tell you personally, because I got to play Jefferson Park. It's a fantastic course. And the, the staff there is unbelievable. And they have an unreal setup uh, that's uh, very family oriented. And uh, I can tell you when I was there, the place was absolutely rocking. Uh, so many people and not everybody was there just to play golf. Some people are there for the restaurant. They're there for the, the driving range. They have a nice putting green out front uh, of the, uh, the restaurant area. And it's a very social event. So, uh, you know, it's a great place, uh, to go and spend some time if you're ever in that area. Um, Thanks, Joe. I appreciate that. One question that's come in, uh, if you can track, uh, your beer angels, uh, can you track superintendent <laughs> vehicles? And yes, ob obviously we can. And, and I think one of the efficiencies that uh, the supers are then finding if, if they're tapping into the live map, they can see if there's a viable gap in the field that never happens at Jefferson Park. But at most other courses, there's a viable gap in the field <laughs> to go uh, get their team to get more done without getting in the golfer's way. And also um, at, uh, at a cart course, we can track all the movement of any cart at any time all the time so we know where is likely compaction going to happen um, and we know where do carts never go right so how can the superintendents use that information well they can they can save some money on on irrigation uh, labor fertilizer where there's hardly any usage and they need to pay more attention to areas that get a lot of usage and and sometimes it's uh, different to the anecdotal, well, I, I'm seeing the guys here all the time, what you can actually see with the data. Um, sometimes it, it edu educates you further because you don't have your eyes out at, at every hole all the time, but the data gets collected all the time, every second, every minute, of every day. And if you accumulate it, um, it can really become helpful to the supers as well. And, and, and obviously we want these guys to be able to do a great job. Uh, because like we said course conditioning and pace of play and you always have a, a winning a winning formula okay gents um no more questions uh, we're bang on time one hour thank you so much mike that was fantastic thanks joey as well um thank you and uh, you all know to, what to do to get your accreditation points so please go and get them and uh, thanks to the Northwest section for um, making this possible for us. We really appreciate uh, our partnership with you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Thanks. Bye.